Good morning, good afternoon, good day, everyone, and welcome to today's event. It's, today is much more than just a webinar. Today is a virtual launch party for Get Out of Sales Hell, Sherry's brand new book. So everybody, let's have some fun today, okay? My name is Kent Cosmore. I'm the Director of Communications for the Sherry Levitin Group, and I'll be your master of ceremonies today. Uh, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping, okay? Um, this is an interactive event, and there are ways for you to interact. To do so, you'll need to have your webinar dashboard open. If you can't see your dashboard, look for a little orange arrow on the side of your screen and click it. That will open and enlarge the dashboard for you. Now, one way to interact is through a poll that we will conduct. When we open up the poll, you'll have your answers, click the appropriate answer, and hit submit. Another way is to raise your hand. You'll see an avatar that looks like a hand. Just click that, and we'll see your virtual hand raised. Another way to interact with Sherry is to use the chat panel. Just type in your question or statement into that um, panel and hit send, and it'll post on the dashboard. If you don't see that panel open, look for where it says chat. There should be a little arrow. Click that arrow, and it will open up that panel. Now, we're going to cover a lot of very cool information today. Here's what you'll be learning. Today, you'll learn the four default behaviors guaranteed to stop you from reaching your potential and how to kill them. You'll learn how to leverage screenwriting techniques to develop more authentic connections and win more deals. You'll learn how to create urgency without appearing pushy. And you'll learn ways to trick your brain to achieve unthinkable stretch goals. Now, before we bring on the star of the show, I'd like to tell you that I've been working with Sherry Levin for almost 20 years now. I've witnessed a lot of growth, from live seminars and audio cassette tapes and VHS videos, to CDs and DVDs, and finally, to the most sophisticated online virtual training in this or any industry. And through it all, I've seen people and companies across the globe grow, thanks to the information and motivation they receive from one Sherry Levitin. I consider Shari my friend, as well as my mentor, and it's my pleasure today to introduce entrepreneur, speaker, CEO, and author, Ms. Shari Levitin. Shari? Well, thank you, Kent. Thank you for the lovely introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being on the line, and welcome to my lunch party for Heart and Cell. Today is the day my new book is available in selected bookstores and on purchase at Amazon.com. My publisher tells me that because of such strong pre-orders, we're actually in the second printing. So this is very exciting. It's a book launch miracle. And I want to just take a moment and thank some of our early sponsors and contributors. So there's been so many of you. If I forget any of you, I apologize. Some of our larger sponsors and, and supporters, RCI, Wyndham, Grand Lodge, Salesforce, Adobe Systems, the National Home Builders Association, and of course, all of you who for the last 20 years have attended our seminars and really contributed to this mind trust that we've all created. And my goal, and I know your goal if you're on this call, is to help bring pride to salespeople and to let salespeople know across the globe that we can sell with authenticity and integrity and still make a boatload of sales. Our goal here is to leave a legacy of great salespeople. You know, some interesting statistics, Kent, 46% of all graduates, regardless of their major, in the next two years are going to end up in sales. And I think I see many sales leaders on the phone here today. We have a responsibility to show them how to sell the right way. And so, uh, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for 20 years of support. And this is a very exciting day as we release the all new material in my new book, Heart and Cell. Now, before we begin, I want to answer a question that many reporters and radio shows have asked me in the last two, three months leading up to the launch of the book. And that is, what was the inspiration for Heart and Cell? Why did you write the book? And I'd like to bring you back to a story, something that happened at the beginning of my career. And if you've been following me for many years, you may have actually heard of the story, but you may not know it was the inspiration for Heart and Cell. 
So back in the late 90, uh, 1990s, I know I'm dating myself here, I was performing a seminar in Cancun, Mexico. And a gentleman in the back of the room raised his hand towards the end of the first day. And he said, I really like all the techniques and tools that you're teaching us. I like the idea of third level questions. I like the idea of the five commitments. But if we use these things, isn't the customer going to feel, well, sort of manipulated? And I got to tell you, that question stunned me. It threw me. That's not who or what I wanted to be. I didn't want to teach a manipulative sales system. So I said, give me a moment so I can think about it before I answer that question. Well, fortunately for me, that night, I got invited to go out to dinner with the top salespeople. And the very top salesperson introduced himself to me as Appa Pacho. Appa Pacho, I asked. I'd never heard that name before. What does it mean? And he told me, well, in Mexico, what it means is hugger or affectionate one. Appa Pacho confided in me that he had never had any formal sales training. He says, but I love my customers. I guess I'm just Appa Pacho. Well, at that moment, I knew I had the answer for the man in the back of the room, and much later, the inspiration for my book. And I spent the last several years asking myself questions. What makes a top salesperson? Is it this apapacho and this authenticity? Or is it sales techniques? Is it nature or nurture? Are top salespeople salespeople because they understand the science of selling? Or are they top salespeople because they sell with heart? So I made it a mission, and it's been really a wonderful experience in the last three years. I've had an opportunity to, to um, go to courses at Stanford. I've gone in many different verticals, talked to people in high tech, um, sales authors, leaders. And each time I talk to a sales leader or a salesperson, I wanted to know what is it they're saying what is it they're not saying? Do they have secret tips or best practices? What is it that makes them a top performer? And I want to share that information with you today. It was a big aha for me. And what I found out is that top performers know how to balance heart and authenticity with the science of sales and technique. But they also know something much deeper. They know how to connect with themselves. And the truth is, unless you truly connect with your authentic self, you can't connect with your customers or anyone else for that matter. And that's how I came up with the tagline for Heart and Cell. And that is that what you do matters, but who you are, particularly today, matters more. Look, it's no secret we're in an age of distrust. We're in an age where we need authenticity more than ever before. So what this book is about, it's the 10 universal truths that every salesperson and entrepreneur needs to know. And these are the truths. And the reason that I call them truths is what I found is that these truths are applicable in your personal life as well as in your business life. So will they make you a boatload more money? Absolutely. But more importantly, they'll give you sustained fulfillment and happiness in every area of your life. That's why we call them universal truths. On the right side, and again, there's 10 universal truths in the book. On the right side, you'll see what is it as a salesperson or a sales leader, and by the way, for those of you on the call, I see many of my friends that are sales leaders running large organizations. We do have a leader's guide for you so that you can take the truths and implement them with your teams. Many of our clients are instituting a true to month through the leader's guide and they're important sales skills. Sales skills like how to build a structure today, what questions to ask with today's more informed consumer. We talk about how to create urgency without pressure. Emotional commitment precedes economic commitment. We've done a lot of research into the neuroscience on how people make decisions today. Um, we talk about closing today. 
um, how to build trust. So these are all things and techniques, as Apapacho mentioned, that you need to do. But there's something else here because for years I've been sharing with salespeople what to do, how to do it, and why to do it, even the psychology. And from what I understand, it's been very helpful to many salespeople and companies all over the world. Again, we're combining this with who you need to be, which in my mind has been the missing link for what will make you a top performer and your organization a leading organization. So in who you need to be, we talk about how success starts with the growth equation. That's chapter one. I think everybody's favorite chapter is how to deal with constant rejection, how to deal with no, and why you need no in order to grow. We talk about what trust to, truly is today. The trust begins with empathy, but there's actually four components of real trust. We talk about integrity, and then we talk about optimism. Now, today, I'm going to focus on three of these who you need to be, these attributes of a top performer. The growth equation, trust begins with empathy, and looking for wrongs never makes you right. But before we begin, we're going to do a poll, and I'm going to ask you a question. I'd like you to tell me, what is the biggest mistake in your mind salespeople make today. And we're going to give you four options. Kent's going to go ahead and organize the poll. So go ahead and read those. I know a lot of you are doing big launches in front of your teams. Leaders, go ahead and read those four things. And let's take about 60 seconds. Okay, we have the voting coming in. About oh, halfway there. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, you're doing great. This ought to be interesting, Kent. Wow. Yeah, I think so. They're very, oh my goodness. Very good question. And and it's very well divided too, isn't it? What this is surprising. Yeah. Um, I, I know we have a lot of leaders in this group from all over the world. I see some of our friends from Spain. I know it's afternoon for you. There's my friend Marta from Colombia. Hi, Marta. Great to see you. I even know we have a few folks from India on the line. 77% hey, voted. A few more seconds. Okay, closing the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Voting is over. Well, I love this, Kent. I see half of you are saying that one of the biggest mistakes is the failure to manage our own emotional state. And isn't that true? Um, I think that's one of the hardest things for salespeople. 20% um, of you said learn from prior mistakes. Of course, that's the growth equation. 20% sell to specific needs. 10% follow a prescribed sales process. Actually, less important today. We're going to talk about that in Chapter 3. Um, but congratulations. I, I love what you said. It's, it really resonates with me. And I'm going to tell you, guess what? You're all right. It was a little bit of a trick question. There are many mistakes that we make on an ongoing basis. And what I want to talk about before, like I said, I really get into um, some of the who you need to be, is the growth equation, empathy, and optimism, is I want to talk to you about what I believe is the biggest mistake salespeople make is, get this, we know what to do, but we're not doing it. I mean, come on, let's face it. So many of you on the line are veterans. We've worked together for years. You've been to many sales seminars. You've been to numerous sales training. You know what to do. You know you're supposed to listen more than you talk. You know you're supposed to have integrity. You know all of these things. The question then becomes, why aren't we doing them? My friend, emotional intelligence expert and author Colleen Stanley calls it the knowing and doing gap. How can we know what to do but still not do it? Sort of like rock climbing. I can know all about rock climbing, but when you're hanging from 300 feet, all of a sudden <laughs> your emotional state, as you said, you sort of forget what you're supposed to do. And of course, this happens not only in sales, but in our personal life. I mean, let's face it. How many times have you said, okay, only one glass of wine tonight? And, you know, 
three glasses later, I'm not going to eat any dessert. And then, well, you know, it happens. So that's really what I want to ponder. And that's what we ponder at the beginning of the book is what are the biggest mistakes? And a, a lot of them we know. You may have looked at the universal truths, for example, and said, sure, I know that. I know that. But why aren't you doing it every single time? Well, here's what's interesting. Turns out there's a scientific reason why. And this is something that I studied, and I find it fascinating. There's, all, there's actually a part in the brain called the default mode network of the brain. And here's what's interesting. When we're not focused, on, you can look it up online, it's fascinating. When you're not focused on the outside world, the brain is sort of in a wakeful rest. It's, call it the path of least resistance. But this part of the brain that you see right here actually lights up. It's a reward and recognition center of our brain, and it's wonderful if you're on a hike or with a loved one or watching a football game, but it's not so great not to be engaged when you're face-to-face -face with your customer or even on the phone. I know we have many inside sales reps here today. When you're on the phone with a customer, you need to be completely focused. Now, what do we do about this path of least resistance? Now, I want to tell you, I first heard about this in a yoga class. I've been practicing yoga for quite a while. I am by no means a master, but I will tell you, my instructor, David, said we all have tendencies or default mode behaviors that we need to overcome. He was talking about it physically. Now, wherever you are right now, if you're in a classroom, if you're in your office, I want you to look at your shoulders. Are they slumped? That's default mode, path of least resistance. That's a lot easier than standing up straight. Is your tailbone tucked, kind of a yoga term. But you want to look at your physical body and say, where do I default? Because we do default into the path of least resistance. Well, guess what? This default or these tendencies where we move into this path of least resistance happens to salespeople all the time. And I've created an acronym called sales hell. Maybe politically incorrect, but it is an acronym nonetheless. And what that means is we default because of four psychological behaviors. So if you know what to do and you're not doing it, you're probably in one of these phases of sales hell. I'm going to take about 10 minutes and talk about this at the very beginning because it, when you have awareness of a habit or something you're doing. That's the only way salespeople and sales leaders, you can overcome it. And sales leaders, you can guide and coach your salespeople out of sales hell as well. The first reason we default is out of sheer habit. Now, habit is very fascinating. If, if you think about it, we all have habits. Some are good, some are bad, Many of them are mundane. Charles Duhigg, who wrote the book, The Power of Habit, says that everything we do in a day, or 70 to 80% of what we do, ladies and gentlemen, is out of sheer habit. We're not thinking about it. From the way we parallel park, to the way we brush our teeth, to the way you make your morning coffee, if you're like most people, you sit in the same part of the classroom, you go to the same bathroom stall. This is habit. Now, some habits are good and some habits are bad. And most habits, we don't even recognize that we have. As I was writing this, I started looking and analyzing my own habits. And I realized I have some new habits that I probably ought to overcome. And I'll give you an example. The other day I was online and I was reading a blog from one of my favorites, Seth Godin. And uh, I love Seth Godin, so I'm reading a blog and I thought, huh, let me see if we're Facebook friends. It would be fun to be Facebook friends with Seth. So I go over to Facebook. Well, now 10 minutes has passed. I'm on Facebook. I see that a new friend of mine got a Maltese named Scrappy. Wow, that's a really cute dog. Then I start thinking, our older dog Remo is getting a little bit old. We're going to need to replace Remo. He's going to go one day. Maybe I should look at Maltese's. So I look up Maltese's online. Sure enough, who owns a Maltese? Jessica Simpson. So now I realize Jessica Simpson's pregnant for the 
third time her curves are going to get even bigger, says the article, and I start reading all about Jessica Simpson for 45 minutes, not a great habit. We all have this new habit of getting online, supposed multitasking, and it can be a real time suck, particularly for you salespeople. So again, it, it's an awareness of these habits that we have. Again, some are good, some are bad. Now, I want to talk really quickly about the three sales habits that I am seeing most today that happen out of habit, and I want you to please take a good look at your own habits. Leaders, great exercise to do right after we get off the phone today with your sales teams. What are the tendencies, what are the habits that we fall into? The biggest habit I'm seeing today with sales teams is we're using the same tired pitch with a very different consumer. We talk in heart and cell about the major shifts in consumer behavior today. Um, consumers default to distrust. Distrust is at an all-time low. Doesn't take a lot. Just read the papers. Gallup says the only people customers distrust today more than salespeople, you got it, members of Congress. Um, today's customers have more information. They come into our sales centers, our offices, or they're on the other end of the phone. They know 83% about your product before they even come to see you or engage with you. Um, overwhelm is making a lot of changes necessary. Um, we're taking in five times more information today than at any other time in history. This call causes a phenomenon known as decision fatigue. Many of our old practices like getting little yeses through the presentation no longer serve you. Customers can't make too many decisions in a day or they just blow, they're exhausted. So in heart and cell, I'm going to tell you exactly how to deal with this new change in customer behavior. We're going to talk about some new science and um, some new, new um, techniques that you're going to need to use. A um, couple more really quick habits, retelling the same stories that lack emotion and, and I see sales stories that are so tired the salesperson's getting bored. So in chapter nine, we're going to tell you how to invigorate your stories. We're going to talk about a new way to tell stories called the hero's journey. We're going to talk about working with punchline. And of course, the big one, failure to listen to the new client that is in front of you, the habit of delivering the same pitch to the same customer. What do you do? So these are just some major habits that I wanted to bring up, particularly the habits that I'm seeing. The next default behavior in sales hell, and again, the reason we know what to do, but don't always do it, is ego. Now, I wish I could tell you I'd mastered my ego. That's a really tough one. In fact, there's research by Meyer and Greenberg that says top salespeople have big egos. Now that might surprise you, but it's ego that gives us the ability to claim greatness. It's positive ego. See, there's positive ego and negative ego. Positive ego gives us the ability to say, I'm going to be the top salesperson in the company. You know what? I'm going to be the best CEO there ever was. A woman I work with named Amy Lawrence who works at Hilton, I love this, we were doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching, and I said, what are your goals, Amy? She says, well, I'm going to have Mark Wang's job. Well, at the time, Mark Wang was CEO of all of Hilton. Gotta love that. Love that girl's positive ego. Now, here's the corollary to ego. An overblown ego keeps us from learning. An overblown ego causes us to blame everything and everybody for our lack of success. It's ego that comes in the negative ego and keeps us from reaching our true potential because we end up with a broken sales presentation and we don't ask for help. So again, one of the default behaviors is ego and it's hard to look at your own ego and say, hey, am I blaming or is it something 
I could do differently. In chapter one, we talk a lot about taking responsibility and I give you a formula to change your self-talk. One of my greatest mentors made me change my self-talk. I wasn't allowed to say my client couldn't afford it. I had to say I didn't show him the value. I couldn't help him get it through his corporate budget. So again, we're going to give you a lot of tools throughout the book so that you can really work on that ego, uh, which is a lifetime uh, to get that ego in check. So we'll be talking a lot about that. The next piece of sales hell is lack of knowledge. Sometimes we just don't know. We fall into sales hell. We fall into a default behavior simply because we don't know. Now, we either haven't been taught or we didn't take the initiative as salespeople and sales leaders to learn to new technology, um, learn new best practices. We need to make sure that our best practices are everyday practices. I love this line by Zig Ziglar. He said, I looked in the obituary today and a lot of salespeople died, but not one was born. Salespeople today more than ever need to constantly increase their knowledge. And if you're not getting it from your manager, get it somewhere else. There's plenty of knowledge out there. And we need to, I'm going to say something to the leaders that are on the call, and that is today we need to hire for heart and train for skills. If you can get both, great. But you need to hire salespeople that have this growth orientation, that are willing to look at their mistakes, that have the empathy, that have the optimism. And that is even more important today. All research shows that these soft skills are even more important than the hard skills. Again, you want both, but you want to hire for soft skills. Okay? And then finally, in sales hell, I want to talk really quickly about just sheer laziness. We're all guilty of this. We work hard. I'm looking at a lot of you on the other end, and I know how hard you work every day. And so it's easy to default into laziness. It's easy for salespeople to take the path of least resistance, to call the, you know, to not prospect for new leads, but to call the same existing leads. It's easy to not really listen, to not really isolate objections. And the, one of the biggest things that we're seeing today is that there's a tendency not to listen as well as we should. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. And very interesting research that I'm going to talk about in Chapter 7, and that is too many salespeople don't have patience. Again, this is, a, this is a soft skill. We don't have patience. We want instant gratification, and we're lazy. And as soon as we get a buying signal in the discovery, we jump to present our product. So we don't do that long, in-depth discovery so that we can get all the information we need. And this is just due to laziness, the exciting of wanting to say, we got that product. It, We've got it for you. We're going to show it to you causes a disease in salespeople today. And we call it premature demonstration syndrome. 58% of salespeople, according to research today, pitch too soon. And that will cost you sales. Very interesting. Again, we're going to show you the research in Chapter 7. Chapter 7, by the way, we're going to show you the new questions that you need to ask today's consumers. Again, a lot has shifted since I first came out with my audio tapes and then my video tapes 10, 15 years ago. And I am literally giving you the keys to the kingdom in this book. I'm going to give you all of the new science, again, coupled with the who you need to be. So these are the four pieces of sales hell, the default modes that we all fall into. I want to give you a chance right now to write in what are some of the default behaviors that you see yourself fall into? Okay, so go ahead and write them in the questions portion. I'd love to hear from you right now. 
Okay, thank you, Vicki. Managing our own emotional state, very, very difficult. Um, we talk about that in Chapter 10 quite a bit. Same old pitch. Yep, Allison, we, <laughs> we do that, don't we? And, and, and you know, it's because we're comfortable, um, and that's a habit. And we think, well, it worked before, and then it stops working as well. Um, yep, laziness. Thank you, Seth, for that. Um, we just, we get lazy. And, and look, no one's immune. You know, I teach this stuff because I want to learn it. I fall into sales hell all the time. And uh, we all do it in every aspect of our life. But like I said, the key is awareness. And one of the things that we have in the Leader's Guide is we go ahead and talk about all the default behaviors, the most common default behaviors of salespeople, and then you're going to put an H, an E, an L, or an L next to it. And again, I encourage you in your meetings today to look at some of the common default behaviors and ask yourself, why do I do that? And the 10 universal truths are going to share with you how to overcome them. That's what the book's about. How do we overcome them? All right, I'm going to give you um, a sneak peek of some of the chapters right now. And uh, it's by no me means a complete look. Of course, at the end of this short session, I'm going to be sharing with you how you can buy the book today and receive a sales mastery kit, probably worth thousands of dollars of information. I've got interviews in there with top leaders, authors, vice president of Salesforce, so in many different industries that are all doing what we're doing. Um, we're also going to be donating to charity today, to one of my favorite charities for anybody who sends me a receipt from the sale of a book, even book sales. Uh, so it's going to be fun, so stay on the line. We've got about 20 more minutes. Again, how do we get out of sales hell? And the way we do that is we follow the 10 universal truths. So that's really what this is all about. I want to start very quickly and talk about a little bit of information from the chapter one, the growth equation. I've had many people tell me that was worth the price of admission, admission is the growth equation. And I find this very key today, universal truth number one. Top salespeople share a willingness to take responsibility for their weaknesses, a deep curiosity about their customers, and a desire for mastery. They commit to using what they've learned about their processes to continue improving. When you master this growth equation, you'll not only improve your sales, you'll transform your life. We begin chapter one talking about Stanford professor and author Carol Dweck. And Carol Dweck says, the growth equation is so important. It's import more important than skills and intellect. It's a passion for stretching yourselves. It's a passion for growing. Now she divides all people, salespeople, children, leaders, into one of two mindsets. You can either have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Now, this can also change. It's not stagnant throughout your life. I know I've had a fixed mindset, and it's cost me dearly. But a fixed mindset sounds like, and you know people like this, um, it sounds like, I'm not good at math. I'm not good at technology. I don't remember people's names. I don't do well with engineers. A growth mindset, on the other hand, people with a growth mindset say, I'm going to learn that. I'm going to learn from the top salesperson. I'm going to find a mentor. And we talk in this chapter about how to find a mentor. People with a growth mindset say, I can learn this. I can conquer this. And I'm going to tell you an embarrassing story about me. I wasn't going to tell you this webinar with hundreds of people on it, but it is in my book. So I'll go ahead and tell you. Um, back seven, I guess it was nine years ago, when my husband and I first met, uh, my now husband, I knew it was a special relationship, and we got very close very fast. We had only been together for three months, and we were sitting at a, co a coffee shop. It was very crowded, but he got very close to me, and he grabbed my hand, and he looked me in the eye, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is happening very soon. This is exciting. And he says, you know, Sherry, you are really smart. 
but you're a Ferrari on crap gas. I said, excuse me? What do, what do you mean by that? Now, this was the first fight we ever had. I was furious. What do you mean I'm a Ferrari on crap gas? He says, oh, you're really smart, but you're not feeding your mind with information. You've got lousy gas. He said, you don't know enough about the world. You don't know enough about politics. You don't know enough about art. You don't know enough um, about science. And I was furious. I thought, well, I'm building a company. I have to learn social media. I have to learn marketing. How dare you? And we got in a fight, but I got to tell you, he was right. And over the course of the next several months and now the next years, I started reading newspapers every day. I started reading The Economist, The Atlantic, TED Talks. A good friend of mine, Eric White, who's a wonderful supporter, says he has all of his salespeople in Mexico read an American newspaper every day because how can we possibly sell a fifty hundred thousand dollar product to a customer if we don't know what's going on in their world. And I can tell you today, this growth mindset doesn't just have to do with sales. My father once told me, for every disciplined effort, there's a multiple reward. Grow, learn, really, it will change your life. Not only will it help you to gain more rapport with different types of people, but it'll help you to see the interconnection of things and just make you a more interesting person. And I know a lot of you are already doing that, but I can tell you it was one of the biggest shifts I had to make, and I'm still making it all the time and saying, what more can I learn? How can I more connect with different types of people? Um, the result was a good one personally. Um, I think I've got a picture here um, of my husband. We did marry three and a half years ago, and I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world. I adopted his then nine-year-old son, and uh, I don't know if it's because I got better gas or uh, what happened, but wanted to tell you that, that little anecdote. Um, so again, growth, and um, the whole chapter is filled with specific things that we can do. I will say that we talk quite a bit about curiosity. The growth equation is filled with three different components, and it's curiosity, responsibility and unconscious mastery. And I just want to mention for salespeople, again, for years I've been teaching salespeople how to ask questions in the discovery process. And we do that in Chapter 7. What are the exact four types of questions you need to ask today? But without curiosity, we don't really care about the response. So we end up engaging in monologue rather than dialogue. And so this curiosity component is key. And in chapter one, we're gonna talk about how to amp up your curiosity, what you need to do, we're gonna talk about responsibility, and my favorite part at the end of the chapter, we're gonna talk about unconscious mastery, and I interview Maria Marganot, who heads up Wyndham, and she talks about why we need unconscious mastery. We need to know our presentation our technology so well that we're not thinking about what to do and say, but rather we're focusing on the customer that's in front of us. So that's a little bit about chapter one. Again, chapter one alone, um, a lot of leaders are going to be using just a chapter a month for their education for the new year uh, with the 10 universal truths. Next, really quickly, I want to go through a little bit what we talk about in Chapter 6. And um, in Chapter 6, we're going to talk about the universal truth number 5, trust. Trust is born of empathy, integrity, reliability, and competency. You need all four traits. But without connecting on an empathetic level, you won't have a chance to demonstrate the other three. Now, for years, we've been told in order to get trust, we have to get somebody to like you. I'm going to tell you that's backwards. The true key to trust is for us to like the customer first. It's for us to have true empathy, for us to care. So in this chapter, I'm going to give you eight keys to really building your empathy skills and your rapport skills because let's face it, it's tough to have empathy for the 50th customer in a row, for the CEO that brushes you off, 
it's tough to cultivate it truly authentically from within. But when you practice these skills I'm going to share with you, you will actually have a shift and you will care more. It actually shifts what you feel inside. Very, very interesting. So that's going to be a great, great chapter. I do want to give you one little tidbit here, and that is about real listening. Again, for years I've been talking about what to ask. In this chapter, we talk about how to listen. Listening is harder today than ever before. According to research by Sherry Turkle, empathy in millennials has dropped by 40%. Why? Technology. Let's face it. It's harder for us to engage in conversation. Conversations are less deep. We're so worried about getting buzzed and interrupted. I'm guessing some of you, even while I'm talking, you're checking your phones, you're checking your texts. We all know in, um, attention span has dropped from 30 seconds to 8 seconds. But I'm going to challenge every one of you on the other end of this line. Is it that customers don't have attention span? or that we aren't giving them a reason to have interest span. We're all interested if it's something we're interested in. I bet many of you have binge watched Game of Thrones or Mad Men or something else. You're interested. How do we make our presentations interesting and engaging? We talk about that in chapter nine, but I'm gonna give you something right here from chapter six. It's a new way to listen. And I heard a podcast by Robert McGee. He's a, a screenwriter and he talks about screenwriting techniques. And what Robert McGee says is that when you're engaging in dialogue or when you're writing dialogue, there's three dimensions that you wanna look at. And this is great for salespeople, so I put it in the book for salespeople, and that is this. When you listen today with your client, think of these three dimensions of listening. The said, that's dimension one, what people are telling you. Here's where it gets deeper, the unsaid. What's your prospect or your customer feeling, but they may not tell you? How do you... Get to the emotion behind the words. How do you really look at that body language, the eye movements? But here's the big one, the unsayable. What the client may not even know psychologically they're experiencing. And when we listen on all three of those levels, that's how we can match and tailor our product offering to what's most important for them. That's how we have the empathy and the courage. When we talk about empathy, it's not just listening and building rapport. It's knowing how hard to push and when. How do you ask the difficult questions? How do you have courage without being pushy? Again, we talk about that in chapter nine, but I'm going to tell you one thing, and that is this. The root of the word courage or core stems is, the, is actually the, the word for heart. So if you believe in what you're doing, your product, your message enough, you will muster up the courage to ask the difficult questions. All right, so we're going to move on uh, real quick. Uh, one more thing that I think is interesting before we go on to the last section here, and that is research shows that one of the reasons we talk more than we listen, why it's so difficult to listen. Again, I love this brain stuff. There's actually a portion of our brain that lights up when we talk about ourselves. It's the same reward and recognition system that lights up when we have good food or engage in sex or um, you know do any pleasurable activity. So there's a tendency to a default mode to talk more than we listen on social media, it's worse. So again, when it's hard for you to listen, just remember, this is my brain, fight that default mode network, fight that tendency because at the end of the day, You'd rather have your customers feel good than have you feel good. All right, last section we're going to talk about before we give away lots of prizes here today. And this is my favorite section as we talk about optimism or chapter 10. Of course, I've been highlighting today the 
who you need to be instead of the what you need to do in the 10 universal truths of my book Heart and Cell. Every day in every encounter you have a choice. You can look for what's right about the experience, what's valuable or productive, or you can look for what's wrong. When you're interacting with your associates, don't look for reasons why they won't buy. Instead, look for reasons why they will. Because what you look for, you can be certain you'll find. Again, let's go to research about the brain. There is a natural tendency we're hardwired for survival. There's a natural tendency for you as a salesperson, as a human being, to default into fear. It's part of our survival mechanism. I mean, how many times have we worried about a presentation? We're worried about paying our mortgage. We worry. This We're hardwired for survival, which is great if a mountain lion's in front of you, but I haven't seen a ton of mountain lions. Fight or flight can be useful, but here's the interesting fact. Optimism and fear cannot occupy the same part of the brain. What that means is if you can put in an actual effort and use optimism tools, you will actually be more productive. Because when you are in the optimistic part of your brain or the neocortex, you're actually more creative. You can connect better with people and you can problem solve. I bring this up because I've met an awful lot of people, and I've been one of them, that says, if only I had better leads, then I'd do well. If only I was with a better company, then I'd be great, then I, then I would be a success. If only I had a husband, if only I had a boyfriend, if only I had a million dollars, then I would be. And I'm here to tell you, that's backwards. Sean Anker talks about this in his famous TED speech. He says, actually, optimism fuels success because we're in that bigger part of our brain. In fact, neurologically, what happens is when you're happy first, dopamine floods your brain, making you more creative, more joyous. It opens your heart, the learning centers in your brain. And so we need to reverse the happiness first formula. Optimism fuels productivity. Now that sounds kind of airy-fairy or more easily said than done, but I am telling you, if you use these tools in chapter 10, they are breakthrough. And I give you actual tools. We're gonna go through six of them. How do you do an appreciation audit? This is by a famous psychologist, um, Seligman and Dan Baker, a good friend of mine, we talk about what Mark Zuckerberg does and did in order to build Facebook, how he uses gratitude. Gratitude is the parent of all optimism tools. What do you need to do? I tell you a great story about one of the best car salespeople of all time who practices constructional delusion. We talk about looking for what's right, stopping problems, probably the most important tool of all, and that is finding our purpose. You know, for years as salespeople, we ask questions, we build relationships, we attempt to find client needs and pain points. My question to you is, how often do you stop and ask, what drives me deep inside? The truth is, it's the most important question you can ask. It's much more important than what are my goals. What are my goals is what I'm going to do. But what drives me is who I want to become, who I want to be. And we give you some exercises. We talk about if you earned an extra $5,000 a month, what would you do with it? You might say invest it, but then what? And then what? And then what? And we really give you a formula to help you isolate how you can find your purpose. Because let's face it. Sales is a tough game. It's full of rejection. And unless we are motivated intrinsically, we can't keep on keeping on. Another thing we look at, what forgets to make, what do you, what, what do you love so much that you forget to eat and poop? What do you love to do? And I'm the first one to tell you, if you don't love what you do every day and you're selling for the money, you're in the wrong profession. 
like Apapacho, you've got to have the right intent. You have to really care about making life better for your customers. Here's a big one, and I want to leave you this before we give away prizes and talk about uh, different options, how you can buy the book today, and that is this. What do you want your obituary to say? I talk about in Chapter 10, one of my favorite authors, he's a columnist, in The Road to Character, David Brooks describes the difference between resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are the skills that you bring to the marketplace. They're techniques. They're what Apapacho talked about, and they're important. You've got to have sales techniques. You've got to have drive. You've got to have the ability to isolate. You've got to have the ability to create a customer experience. You've got to have competition. You've got to have all of these different resume virtues. But eulogy virtues, on the other hand, are those virtues that people talk about at your funeral. Virtues like curiosity, integrity, and optimism. What do you want your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered? Because at the end of the day, it's the combination of character, apapacho, and skills that's going to help you radiate that inner confidence and get long-term, sustained success. So in Heart and Cell, we're going to give you the 10 universal truths of what you need to do, but I believe, more importantly, who you need to be so that you can make the money you deserve, leave the legacy you want to leave, and have the fulfillment that you've always wanted to have. So with that, let's get on. Thank you for listening to my uh, overview. There's so much great information. Like I said, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. This book for you is for you if, and we're going to go through, uh, if you want to increase your wealth, we've already had early readers saying that it's made a huge difference. Thank you. I just want to express my gratitude to so many. It's in the acknowledgments. There's too many of you to name today. Um, of course, all of you that are on the phone today and that have supported Levitin Group throughout the years. This book is for you if you want to raise your satisfaction, spend more time with your loved ones. My goodness, today we can work smarter, not harder. Um, create a roadmap for sales and positive communication. And mostly, I want you to feel pride in your work and know that you can crush your sales goals without losing your soul. So today, this is my launch day. This is exciting. We're having a party. Like I said, thank you for all the pre-sales, everyone. We're hitting some records today, and it's very exciting. I want to share this with you. Also, I don't think I've ever had a product for $15.95. Um, so I'm excited that everybody can afford to buy this product. We've been coming uh, to different sites for $20,000, $30,000 selling virtual training programs. You can have this for a very small amount of money today. Uh, some phenomenal reviews. Thank you, Michael Brown, best-selling author, Jill Conrath. We'll spend love with Salesforce. Um, I'm so glad this book is making a difference for you. Here's how you can go ahead and get involved. Oh, one more thing. If you send me your receipt um, from Amazon, buying on Amazon today, I am going to donate a dollar of every book sale to one of my favorite charities and one of my mentors, Crystal DeHaan. It's a global children's charity transforming the lives of impoverished children to fight uh, and break the cycle of poverty. So we want to give these children a chance to be successful and fulfilled in their lives as a thank you. I'm going to do the same for bulk sales. So even those of you who have stepped up and bought 100, 500 copies, we're going to give a dollar of every book sold to Crystal House today for anybody that purchases. And here's all you need to do. And uh, if we go to the last slide here, like I said, one dollar of every book is donated to Crystal House. Today, also, if you send me your receipt in the next hour, I am going to draw two free one-year memberships to a single subscription, to subscription for Leviton Learning Online. That's a $700 membership. I'm going to award two members today. 
I'm going to tweet it out on social media and uh, let you know. Um, so you've got to go ahead on Amazon right now, purchase Heart and Cell. Look up Sherry Levitin, Heart and Cell. It is for sale. It will be shipped immediately to you so you can start learning and growing. For bulk sales, please call our offices. There's some special things we're doing with Leader's Guide for all of you managers. 435-649-0003, or you can just email me at sherry at sherrylevitin.com. Again, I want to thank all of you. This is an exciting day, and my wish for you is that you have an amazing year, an amazing life, and that you apply those universal truths and make them work for you. Thank you for attending. Love all of you. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much.